Today I'll be looking at Henry Neville's The Isle of the Pines, 1680, 1668, and how it portrays an anxiety over the future of the empire during the early restoration period, and evidences growing concerns over miscegenation in English colonies. First, some information about Henry Neville, the author. He was an English politician, author and satirist best known for The Isle of the Pines, but also known for his translations of the work of Machiavelli and his Republican tract, Plato Redivivus, a dialogue on the decay of English government. He was an important member of the Rump Council of State and a staunch supporter of the expansion of English imperialism and commerce. He was a key proponent in the Commonwealth's aggressive foreign policy, including the first Anglo-Dutch conflict, which was between 1652 and 54. And Blair Warden notes that Neville worried that the restoration had brought a return to the impotence abroad that had characterised the early Stuart period too. He was in political exile when he wrote The Isle of Pines, in total opposition to the Restoration regime. As you can probably already imagine, his position as an exiled critic of the Restoration re regime, wholly in support of English imperial expansion, results in a text that is particularly insightful into the Restoration period's relationship with race and empire. Now, about the Isle of Pines. It is the brief epistolary autobiographical narrative of an Englishman called George Pines, who is shipwrecked in 1589 on an uninhabited island in the Indian Ocean, along with four women, the daughter of the master of the trading ship that was wrecked, two maidservants, and a black servant. Pines sleeps with all four women, fathering 47 children, and by the end of an idle and otherwise unproductive life on this island, is surrounded by 1,789 descendants, consisting of four tribes that descend from each of the four mothers. This, ta this tale formed Neville's first version of the Isle of Pines, but the final version that was published in 1668 combined this version with a sequel Neville had written. In this final version, set in 1668, a Dutch trading ship lands on the island, discovering it to be populated by Pines' descendants, and they learn about Pines' narrative, helpfully preserved, and help to quell an attempted insurrection. The first version of the text, which just detailed Pine's narrative arriving and populating the island, was wildly popular, becoming an instant bestseller on the European market, with more than 20 foreign editions printed in five Western European languages within a few months of its publication. Further versions of the story made it into contemporary news books and gazettes, and the story even travelled across the Atlantic to the American colonies. The second and third version were less popular, and Gabby, L and Gabby M. L. Malberg talks extensively about why that might have been. You can find her essay in the bibliography. Now, I'm going to talk about how the text surfaces a deep anxiety Neville had over the future of the English Empire. The historical context of the publication of the Isle of Pines is important here. The Second Anglo-Dutch War ended in 1667, which had humiliated the English. Dutch warships had destroyed the English navy at Chatham only a year before Neville's text appeared, and it also nearly rooted the English out of the East Indies and Western Africa in the course of their global conflicts. The fact that it is a Dutch trading ship that arrives to the Isle of Pines, a hundred years after George Pine arrived there, is significant. It is the Dutch that bear witness to the deprived and backward degeneration of the English. Adam R. Beach writes most extensively on this area, and he posits... In Neville's text, then, the imaginative Isle of Pines falls into the hands of the Dutch, just as most of England's real possessions in Africa and the East Indies had been taken by them since the restoration of the Stuart line. Neville published the Isle of Pines when there was widespread fear of the Dutch and shock at English martial ineptness. The way the Dutch captain, Henry Cornelius van Sluten, describes their first encounter with the island of Pines' descendants places the English in the position of subaltern, reduced to the naked native. You would have blessed yourself to see how the naked islanders flocked unto us, so wandering at our ship, as if it had been the greatest miracle of nature in the whole world. This quote is revealing. The English are now naked islanders, nudity being a common trope of the uncivilised savage, and one, find in Ben's or an, and one found in Ben's Orinuku, and they flocked like animals, again reaffirming the position of the English as subaltern. The Dutch, however, are presented as godlike figures, being the greatest miracle of nature, and the fact that it, and the fact that it is their ship that the English wander at is particularly humiliating for a country so proud of its naval ability. 
Not only is there anxiety present in this text about Dutch supremacy, there is also deep-rooted anxiety over the inability of the English to further the colonial project when unanchored from authority. The master of the English trading ship does not survive the shipwreck, and so there's no colonial authority on the island. Thus, it descends into a porno utopia, where the only work being done is the sexual prolifer proliferation of George Pine through the four women that live with him. Mary Louise Pratt argues that the European improving eye produces subsistent habitats as, habitats as empty landscapes, meaningful only in terms of a capitalist future and of their producing a marketable surplus. On the Isle of Pines, however, the English eye is lustful rather than capitalist. George does not create a colonial outpost with financial benefits for England, but creates his own population, following his desire before his duty as an English colonist. As Beach puts it, the explosion of sexuality on the island and the, and the attendant dismissal of imperial objectives by its English inhabitants seems an implicit criticism of the Restoration regime. Perhaps Neville is suggesting that the Pines are like Charles II, spending too much time on pleasure and not enough on the business of the nation and the empire. In Neville's final version of the Isle of Pines, the Dutch find an English colonial outpost reduced to idleness, unproductive and uncivilised. The English are amazed by the, Dutch's, by the Dutch's weapons and tools because the only production they have engaged in since arriving on the island a hundred years ago is sexual prol proliferation. The capitalist spirit of the colonial project is undermined by the lustful desires of the English man when unmoored from the centre of colonial authority, England. Now I'm going to talk about the role of miscegenation in the Isle of Pines. The text sees the Isle of Pines face insurrection twice, both times by the Phil's tribe, the descendants of the black servant. Clearly, the miscegenation between the white George Pine and the black Philippa has generational consequences for this island, and Neville reflects the anxieties of the period. He also uses the non-white Phil's tribe to define the whiteness of the other three tribes on the island, doing what Toni Morrison best articulates in Playing in the Dark, Whiteness in the Literary Imagination. The non-white other is a method of definition for the white subject. Boeski, who's the critic I'll refer to most of this section, notes that in 1668, it was the first phase of the Restoration and self-consciousness about England's identity was particularly acute. This self-consciousness, I'll argue, is surfaced in this text. The way Neville describes the first time George Pine and Philippa, the black servant, have sex is remarkably different to the sexual encounters between Pine and the three white women that have already occurred. None now remaining but my Negro, who, seeing what we did, longed also for her share. One night, I being asleep, my Negro, with the consent of others, got close to me, thinking it being dark, to beguile me. But I was awaking and feeling her, and perceiving who it was, yet willing to try the difference, satisfied myself with her. Boeski offers a reading of this moment that likens it to, Mil to Milton's Paradise Lost. There are, a number, there are a number of comparisons to be made between the Isle of Pines and Paradise Lost, as it is a utopian text, but here it has particular significance for the idea of miscegenation. She writes, Pine represents himself as sleeping, vulnerable, rather like Eve in Milton's Paradise Lost, published the previous year, who was also beguiled, also approached at night, asleep and vulnerable, by the serpent who attempts to penetrate the organs of her fancy, precipitating her fall by advocating difference. The slave seduction of Pine involves a similarly, a similarly complicated mixture of consensus and duplicity. This is Pine's original sin, it would seem. He has 12 children with Philippa, and they go on to form the Phil tribe, which go on to cause trouble for this porno utopia. The Phil tribe eventually refused to attend the monthly Bible reading on the island and fell to whoredoms, incest and adulteries. Like their original mother, the Phil tribe are ascribed a sexual deviancy by Neville, the author, and they retain an uncivilised quality to their character. They are, clearly, the unruly natives of the Isle of Pine. They are the others of this otherwise white English outpost. The idea of miscegenation has a significant and pertinent historical context. Boeski notes, in 1662, Virginia passed a law rendering the children of free men and black female slaves according to the condition of the mother, 
Slavery, in other words, was seen as being passed down from a woman to her children. And any Christian who shall commit fornication with a Negro man or woman was obliged to pay a strict fine. This law ensured that female slaves could only produce more slaves, making slavery a sex-linked condition. The female slave was sentenced to reproduce her own incarceration, generation after generation. Neville sees the English world on the Isle of Pines as corrupted by the Phil tribe, the non-white population of the island, and uses these others in order to regulate and save <clears throat> the white English population. Though they are geographically and culturally displaced from England, the white English population of the Isle of Pines retain their national identity through their difference to the non-white population of the island. Boesky articulates it perfectly when she writes, On the Isle of Pines, with its cyclical, and in, with its cyclical insurrections and executions, the repression and containment of one part of the population is used to illustrate the superiority of all others. Anxieties about, <clears throat> sorry, anxieties about England's decline in colonial power in the early Restoration period and Dutch supremacy can be found in the Isle of Pines, as can concerns over the growing miscegenation in English colonies. The way these anxieties and concerns manifest themselves in Neville's short text are, in some ways, at odds with each other. He presents the English as uncivilised, backwards and dangerously unproductive in the eyes of the Dutch visitors, satirising and mocking the Restoration regime for its ineptitude abroad. And yet, he simultaneously affords the white English people of the island a civilised and English quality because of their difference from the non-white Phil tribe. As a result of the miscegenation between George Pine and Philippa, his black servant, the white English population are saved and connected back to their home country because they have an other against which they can define themselves. Beach and Boesky offer differing but complementary readings of this text that offer particular insight into the attitudes of the Restoration period to race and empire. Neville's unique position of anti-Restoration Republican makes him an effective conduit for the surfacing of the anxieties and concerns of the time. I'd really recommend you have a read of his work. The Isle of Pines is only 30 pages long because I really haven't done it, um, I really haven't fully done it justice here. I'll attach a link to an online edition in the bibliography, along with all the um, secondary reading I did. But yeah, thank you for listening.